Okay. So here is today's agenda. We're going to do a quick overview of Action for Healthy Kids and who we are, and then talk about the importance of nutrition education, some of the research that shows the importance uh, and the benefits for the child uh, mind body connection, and then share ways you can extend nutrition education in different environments um, from the classroom to the cafeteria to school gardens and talk about how you can engage families and students at home. And then we'll wrap up a little bit about grant requirements and assessments and resources um, that can help you grow your program. Still trying to figure out which buttons will change my slides here. Here are the things we want you to take away from today's session. We want you to be aware of some of the proven best practices for implementing nutrition education curriculum. Uh, we want you to be comfortable discussing strategies for implementing good nutrition education program. We want you to understand the requirements for evaluation and outcomes. And want you to be prepared to work with your team and your schools to identify strategies for engaging students and families. So we've already talked about this and get you to uh, put your name and job title. And if you have a bizarre food that you like, I know Elvis loved peanut butter and bananas, but um, if there's a bizarre food combination you love, share it with us. I'm pretty boring. I did peanut butter and cheese, which <laughs> was a terrible combination for me health-wise when I was a kid. But <laughs> anybody have something good that we should all try? Pickles on anything. <laughs> a lot of people that eat ketchup on everything. Oh, that's an interesting one. Oh, you know, Sandy, that reminds me, I like spaghetti and cottage cheese. I guess that's kind of a weird combo. I've never had that. I'll give it a try. Yeah, uh, it's, it's really good. Pineapples and mayonnaise. Mm. And there's something about the cold cottage cheese and the hot spaghetti. It's just. Yum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Y'all can continue to add things as, if you'd like, um, but we'll get moving. Action for Healthy Kids is a national nonprofit organization that commits to the belief of healthy kids create a better world. We pursue this vision by mobilizing family school partnerships to uh, address child health issues and prepare kids to be healthy in body and mind. Our network is made up of moms and dads and teachers and students, school and community leaders, and we believe that everyone has a part to play in ensuring that children are safe, engaged, supported, and healthy. Uh, we were founded back in 2002 when Dr. David Satcher was the Surgeon General and declared we had an obesity epidemic. And they brought together teams from all 50 states to try to come up with ways to help kids be healthier because changing adult habits is a lot harder than changing kid habits. So. Um, we've been around for 20 years. Um, we've had some really strong work over the years, a lot of uh, policies and processes and grants and different things. Um, we are embracing the whole child model uh, as we move forward and putting specific emphasis around um, social emotional health as well as physical activity and nutrition. So we've evolved a lot over the last 20 years. I think I've missed the slide there somehow. I just, I talked before I changed the slide. So what we do with our collaborations with families and schools and school districts focus on three key areas of child health. Um, as I mentioned, nutrition, which is our nourished program, physical activity and active play, which we are calling energized and social emotional health and risk behavior prevention, which is our connected. Um, we want to bring all the different groups together from school districts to schools to families with the child as a center focus. And what you see around these, around the edges is, are the different ways that we impact these different areas through grants, through technical assistance, learning sessions, coaching, peer-to-peer um, -peer connections, and embracing, as I mentioned, the whole child model. So the whole child model, is everybody familiar with the whole child model? 
I know in, in Texas, we actually still use what's called the coordinated school health model, which preceded the whole child model. But it's made up of, the whole child model is made up of 10 components that working together with the community and the schools helps bring all the different areas into, into focus and make sure that they're working together and you don't have a bunch of silos at your district. So uh, we bring in together Action for Healthy Kids partners for collective impact with other groups. Um, the Catch Global Foundation is one of our partners and they focus on um, nutrition, physical activity and um, different aspects of child health through the model. And then we also have the Active Schools um, organization which is part of Action for Healthy Kids now. So I'm gonna pass this over to Natalie now to talk a little bit about nutrition practices. Does anybody have any questions about Action for Healthy Kids or, or what we do or why we do it? I'm happy to answer them. Okay, take it away, Natalie. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Michelle. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for kicking us off with that um, background information on Action for Healthy Kids. Um, but what we'd like to do now is um, in the chat, if you could tell us uh, why you all believe nutrition education is important. Um, we're going to sort of do a little bit of a deep dive into nutrition education and what it is, but love to hear, you know, from, from you guys in the field, um, maybe some benefits that you've all seen of implementing nutrition education in your respective districts and why you think that's important. Um, if you prefer to unmute and, and kind of, you know, we could chat about it or if you wanna drop it into the chat box, um, we'd appreciate that. We'll have a couple of these opportunities as we go through the slides and the, the presentation, um, an opportunity to kind of share a little bit more about, you know, your thoughts and your districts and what's going on locally. Well, we'll let you guys all, you know, sort of drop that in um, as at your leisure. Um, but moving on to, um, you know, nutrition education, you're probably all very familiar with um, my plate and this infographic. And really, nutrition education is a set of learning experiences that is designed to assist in healthy eating choices and other positive nutrition related behaviors. It really reinforces specific nutrition practices and behaviors to change habits that contribute to poor health and, and protect the health of children. And as you can see here, um, it really, this, this infographic really focuses on four messages. First of all, it focuses on variety, the amount and nutrition, and also encourages students to choose, or everyone, um, kids and, and adults alike, to choose foods and beverages with less saturated fats, sodium, and added sugars. Um, and start with small changes to build a healthier lifestyles. And lastly, support healthy eating for everyone. So it really is a, a, a memorable, sort of colorful way to um, show us, you know, and is really at the heart of nutrition education. So I did see that we got a couple of responses dropped into the chat. Um, and absolutely, you know, because it has to start at an early age, um, kids need to understand the impact nutrition has on how they feel. Definitely, we'll touch on that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, reach students early to impact their lives. Maybe their only exposure to learning about healthy eating isn't that right. Um, from the iPhone, students don't seem to be taught the proper nutrition at home with the school district with a high poverty level, healthier foods are often too expensive. Very good, yes. It helps um, having a variety of choices. Nutrition is key to the growth and learning process of our children. It's exactly it. Thank you for, for sharing all that. Um, and so, you know, in the next slide, what we see here is why is nutrition education important? I think we've definitely touched on that with these comments, um, but the reality is that U.S. students receive less than eight hours of required nutrition education each school year. And how many hours show a change in behavior? 
um, far below the 40 to 50 hours that are needed to affect behavior change. So we've seen that over 20, um, 2000 and um, 2014, we've seen a decrease from 84% to about 74% on schools that are actually providing this instruction that is so necessary for the development of healthy kids. And so I wanted to ask again, um, if you all can drop in the chat, um, and, and this is a judgment-free zone, how many hours do, would you say your school district or your school um, is delivering, you know, nutrition education? Um, just to kind of get an idea of, of, you know, what's happening out in the field and what's happening in your districts, how many hours would you say that um, nutrition education is being delivered um, where, where you're at. And so anyway, I'll, I'll let you guys all think about that and drop those in as, as you feel comfort. Um, but we'd like to get into a little bit about the research and what it shows. Um, many studies of school-based nutrition education interventions evaluated the effectiveness of programs to develop healthy habits and prevent childhood, childhood obesity. Um, and here are a couple of conclusions that were noted based on these two studies that you see here on this slide. This meta-analysis indicated that nutrition education programs that run for more than a year can effectively decrease the prevalence of obesity. So that's definitely promising and, and, and good, um, good conclusion that was uh, found there. Multidisciplinary school-based interventions, including family involvement, are the best and, no, and most sustainable approach. And that was a second study that was also, um, that was also found the supporting research. And so it's demonstrated that when a school has a parent champion for school health, more parents are involved in health activities and school improvement plans more frequently include goals, programs, policies, addressing school health issues, such as nutrition education. These findings are reinforced by research that demonstrates the impact of parent involvement on the success of health education programs. Parents, caregivers, and families are key to supporting healthy eating at home and at school. Educating families on available school meal programs and their benefits can improve um, support for school nutrition and may increase, increase school meal participation. I so, put, yeah, I did. Oh, no, go ahead, research, Michelle. Uh, I did put the research link for CDC in the chat so you guys can access that information. Awesome. Great. And I see that I, I saw a couple of responses dropped into the chat. Um, in the elementary school, mostly in PE during two times two week fitness unit, awesome. Um, maybe four hours on the elementary level, four to six hours a year, hopefully more, but not all on campuses. So definitely, I mean, it, thank you for, for sharing for sharing that. And we, we see based on the, the research that we've just gone over the benefits of, of having um, nutrition education on campus. So we'll get into that actually in this next slide. Um, nutrition education is a vital part of a comprehensive health education program, and it empowers children with the knowledge and skills to make healthy food and beverage choices. And schools play an important role, as we know, in helping students to establish healthy eating behaviors by providing several things, nutritious and appealing foods and beverages, consistent and accurate messages about good nutrition, and ways to learn and practice healthy eating. In order to develop healthy behaviors, a comprehensive nutrition education program should instruct and promote positive habits rather than simply disseminating basic um, nutrition information. Therefore, effective nutrition education should target positive behavior. And it also addresses factors influ influencing behavior. Um, it uses theory and evidence and also provides strategies to convey messages and instruction. So, we know that when nutrition um, education is delivered with sufficient intensity and duration to address the levels of influence, so, such as food preferences and sensory, 
affective factors and also person-related factors such as perceptions, beliefs, attitudes, social norms, and environmental factors. So it's a little bit about nutrition education in schools. And now, as we'll sort of reiterate what has already been dropped into the chat, the benefits of nutrition education. It really boils down to good nutrition equals happy kids. And, and we all know that from our experiences uh, working with kids. And we know that students who eat well have improved test scores, they have better school attendance, fewer behavioral concerns, um, and also they are able to um, develop essential life in academic schools. Um, some of these things can be that they learn strategies such as meal preparation, the relationship between food and feelings, and how to fuel their bodies for daily life activities. And they also learn a positive connection between food and the body. Um, we know that meaningful nutrition education teaches students about food in a way that supports their physical, mental, and emotional and social health. Students learn how to um, feel their best by nourishing themselves and respecting the, respecting the uniqueness of every person. And so these are just some of the benefits of nutrition education. And so as we go through this slide, um, some of you may or may not be familiar with um, this, this infographic here, and we'll kind of get into each of these as, as we go through them. So nutrition education also helps students to develop essential social emotional skills through the development of a greater body um, connection. And Michelle just dropped into the chat this link um, that, you know, it will encourage you all to follow that link, but we'll also follow up our presentation with these links and some more resources. And there are five components on the screen that I want to briefly explain that are in relation to nutrition education. And we'll start off with self-awareness. Uh, lessons about optimal nutrition teach children the importance of taking ownership of their own health. It also encourages students to think about how they feel physically and mentally, depending on the foods they eat. Self-management. Exploring the mind-body connection leads to students greater self-awareness and skills to make better choices to nourish their bodies and help them feel their best. Responsible decision-making. So this is, this is a good one. Nutrition education can help students reflect on their perspectives around nutrition to develop the skills needed to manage impulse control, prevent extremes and set goals. And isn't that what we want for our students that are developing? Also relationship skills. Food we know is social. We gather over food for meals and celebration and we use this time to build relationships with others. Social awareness. Nutrition education serves as an opportunity to teach children about food and the relation, the relation to culture and family heritage. Discussing culinary variances across cultures can help expose our children to different foods and traditional practices, increasing their understanding and appreciation for diversity. So we know that social emotional learning carries on past childhood and continues in adult lives. These skills, when continually practiced and further develop, help children make healthy decisions as they gain independence over what they eat, and how they view food and ultimately help them develop and maintain a healthy relationship with food and their body. So as you all know from your experience in schools, nutrition education doesn't just take place in the classroom or through a textbook. In fact, nutrition education can extend into many environments and enhance other lessons and activities. And it's a great way to support learning and reinforce lifelong healthy eating concepts for kids. Let's go ahead and take a look at a few examples. But before we run into that, we're gonna run a poll um, and we just want to learn a little bit about where you are all at in terms of the learning environment. Um, with different learning environments in place, what's the current structure of your learning environment? Um, is it in person, remote, hybrid, combination? If you can all just take a moment and let us know how it is in each of your districts or schools. 
We have four of, or do we need to ask one more? Because you and I aren't participating, so. Right, think okay. like that. <clears throat> so 100% are back to being in person. Awesome. So, yeah, there it is, sorry. You. And yeah, and and um, so thank you for that. So that's you know that's good to know um, that you're all back in person. And no doubt, I was having a conversation this morning with uh, one of my districts that that comes with its own challenges and and things like that. So we'll talk about how to enhance and extend um, nutrition education lessons in the classroom. So we'll look at. Um, We'll, we'll look at some of these examples and so um, we'll get into it. So one of the things that we've seen, um, that I've seen, and I know, I think Michelle has also seen a little bit of this uh, with the districts that she works in, is um, that basically nutrition education can happen in a variety of ways that are really fun and engaging for students. One of them is starting a windowsill garden. Um, it is simple, cheap and fun for all ages and especially um, at the elementary level. Um, you can do so by purchasing a pack of seeds, a small bag of soil, and even disposable cups, and you've got yourself a garden ready to grow. Um, this is something that can be done at school or even at home, and there's a great connection to science as well. Another thing that I've seen really successful, which can be applied if you're um, you know, remotely or in person, I know that everybody's in person, um, but this works just as well, is to invite local ex experts such as dietitians to teach a lesson on portion sizes or reading nutrition labels. Um, you can reach out to your local college and university, hospital, or chapter of the American Academy of Nutrition and Diet, Diet Dietitians if you uh, need help identifying a volunteer to come in, this is a great um, opportunity for virtual learning um, and learning in Zoom. And there are lots more ideas um, that can be done. If you, if you have any ideas, please feel free to drop it in the chat. We'd love to learn um, how you've successfully done um, education that has extended beyond the classroom. I'm sure everybody on here would love to sort of hear what's been working at your district. Um, and so we can learn also how to enhance and extend nutrition education lessons in the cafeteria. Um, so I know that um, you all are likely in different um, learning environments. Actually, we just said that we're all in the same in person. Um, so we'll go through this rather quickly. Um, one of the ways that we can extend nutrition education is actually in the cafeteria. Cafeterias may also use visual learning through nutrition promotion posters and signage or student artwork promotion, uh, promoting healthy eating. So that would be another great thing too, if you'd like to drop in um, how maybe you've used your cafeteria as a learning lab, as a tasting lab and things like that. Um, I'm sure we would all appreciate learning how that's happened at your district. And next we'll look at how to enhance and extend nutrition education lessons with farm to school. Um, some of this might be challenging um, depending on um, the different restrictions of having any visitors online or on campus. Um, but here are some things that you can maybe consider and that might be useful. Um, purchasing and serving locally or regionally um, grown produce in the school meal programs, that might be an option. At the district level, you can advocate at your school or within your district for more local options being served as part of the school meal program. Um, engaging students in hands-on learning opportunities through gardening, cooking lessons, or even eventually farm field trips. Um, and so we could definitely look at more and more to come on gardens in just a moment. Overall, students who participate in farm to school activities have an increased knowledge about nutrition and agriculture, agriculture, excuse me, and are more willing to try new foods and consume more fruits and vegetables. One of our one of our other districts has done a really good job out in Colorado of tapping into the local farmers and having them provide taste testing things. I mean, a lot of times you can't get enough produce to have full meals or provide a lot of food for your district, 
but you could have enough to do a farm fresh Friday type thing. So don't let limited access uh, to fresh fruits and vegetables locally keep you from at least giving it a shot and try. Yes, thanks Michelle for sharing that. So it is, it is possible, it is doable. Um, so next we'll get into how to enhance and extend nutrition education lessons with school gardens, which I know a few of you on this call are, are looking into doing school gardens. So I hope that we can share something um, that you can take back with you. So gardens can be a great, um, safe, socially distant activities for students. Um, on our website, we have lots of garden resources. If you're interested in starting something simple like a 30 day garden or something more robust that will last even into the summer. And school garden programs can increase students' nutrition knowledge, willingness to try fruit and vegetables and positive attitudes about fruits and vegetables. Um, they also, um, school gardens can also vary in size and purpose. Um, for example, we talked about the windowsill garden, as I mentioned earlier. Um, this can also be done in, um, at home. Another example is doing gardens in raised beds, greenhouses, or planted fields, if you're lucky enough to have that space. Students can prepare the soil for the garden, plant seeds, harvest the fruits and vegetables, and taste the food from the garden. Um, and produce from the garden can also be incorporated in taste tests, um, school meals, and things like that. Um, I know one district that I worked in um, a few years back put together their own little farmer's market and it sort of uh, incorporated some entrepreneurial um, skills from the students as well. So there's definitely lots of applications and things like that that um, can really make this an engaging activity for, um, for students of any age. I know in the city, they've, they've done things like rooftop gardens. Um, oh. You know because there's no place to put one on the ground. So they've actually put them on, on top of roofs. Um, and then we've had one of our, uh, one of ours let the parents come and help work with the kids in the gardens after school. And the parents ended up taking home. It was one way to get fresh fruits and vegetables to the families that needed them. So gardens can be so beneficial, but it's, it's something that requires somebody on the campus that's committed to make sure that they get the volunteers um, we had a community center, a senior center, close to one of our schools, and those seniors came over and worked in those gardens and helped keep it going. So you sometimes have to think outside the box to identify ways of how you can, you know, make it work. But um, one of the gardens is one of the best things that I've seen for teaching kids about fruits and vegetables and where they come from. I mean, I know the kids, you know, a lot of kids aren't even sure where milk comes from. It comes out of a carton or it comes out of the cow chocolate, you know? So all of these things help help the children learn what, what, it, what it actually, fruits and vegetables are really about. My voice is terrible today. <laughs> so is mine. I have a little bit of a dry uh, throat today. So sipping on some tea, um, hopefully it, it's, yeah, it's not too bad. Um, so before I hand it back over to Michelle, we wanted to just kind of go over um, how to enhance and extend nutrition education with intentional messaging. And um, so this really with intentional messaging, what it does is bring other opportunities throughout the day um, that are reinforcing these behaviors um, and these things that they're learning through nutrition education. Um, and basically it helps um, students to, to ensure that students um, see and hear consistent information about healthy eating across the school um, and a school campus and at home as well. Schools can add messages about nutrition education and healthy eating um, into, for example, the morning announcements or even school broadcasts that some schools may have, school-wide assemblies, um, information and activities that are sent home to parents and guardi guardians, um, even social media and the school website can be another platform to um, you know, use this consistent um, messaging. Staff meetings and professional development are also opportunities to reinforce and to um, use intentional messaging. And as noted in the strategies above, you can really be intentional, um, even if you know um, you don't have a lot of, for example, parent contact and things like that. I know that's been one of the challenges that some districts have had where 
um, you know, they just don't have a lot of um, parents um, that are coming onto campus or with it being restricted, you can still use some of these platforms like the website, social media and things like that to have um, this intentional messaging even reach home. We'd also encourage you to take advantage of parent teacher group meetings to both share information and ask for feedback from parents and caregivers. What do they think that's uh, or see that's working? Uh, what would they like to see added or included? Or how would they like to see it incorporated? So these are just some ideas um, where it really um, provides an opportunities for parents to offer some great insight into what's resonating with students and what information and practices they're bringing home. So I'll go ahead and wrap it up here and I'll pass it over back to Michelle. Thanks. I just wanted to mention Sandy's on and, and she was working with us last year with, with several of her schools. And one of her schools really used social media well. They had the kids go home and prepare a healthy dinner and take pictures and post them on Twitter. And the families got into it. And then the, the other, another district that I worked with or another school I worked with in uh, El Paso used uh, Facebook and they had a whole Facebook page and, and the, the kids and the families posted things on Facebook. They did challenges. They, you know, had scavenger hunts to go find healthy fruits and vegetables. And the families, because it was virtual, the families actually, you know, joined in and had a great time. In fact, I've had some of the teachers tell me that it's more challenging doing things now back in person than it was virtually because they, they can't have parents on, on campus. So they can't really get the families involved and where they could when they were home, grandma would come attend the class with the kids and do you know the exercises and things. So um, I've suggested that they go back and do a virtual event that lets the families participate. So if you find it's challenged to get your families engaged, um, consider doing a monthly virtual event. Um, you could do a, a teach a class on preparing smoothies um, and then, uh, or, you know, something about chopping up vegetables or whatever, just something where they can invite their families to participate and they're getting a little bit more exposure. So if y'all have any things that you've done or you've experienced or seen, please feel free to share them in the chat. <coughs> so I'm just gonna skip that. <laughs> so this last part is about implementing um, nutrition education, uh, talking about how we are going to get the nutrition message across. So the ways we implement nutrition education can vary depending on how old the, the grade level or whether you're in person or hybrid or, or uh, but there are some key strategies that we want you to keep in mind. You need to make sure that you accommodate different learning styles. Some people learn better visually, um, having pictures, some people need to hear things and have it reinforced several times. And some people need to have, you know, uh, touch, feel, hands-on type things. You need to incorporate information sharing and experiential learning activities um, and less minimal lecture like what we're doing today. <laughs> I wish this, this session was a little more interactive. Um, but we need to give kids an opportunity to apply what they've learned in a context with their personal experiences. We also need to include uh, frequency and duration. So having a nutrition lesson one week in October and then not doing another one until November is, is probably not the best idea. It's almost better to have all your lessons in that two week time period or have one week in the fall and one week in spring because it, it makes it, reinforcing it really helps the kids. Um, try offering it in a systematic way either monthly, weekly, or as a part of a unit. Implement as design and delivery in its entirety. So whatever lessons curriculum you're using, make sure that you use all of the curriculum and don't um, just use part of it. Um, it's put together very thoughtfully usually to make sure that everything is covered and you know, uh, the frequency is there as well. And be sure and include an at-home learning plan and materials that can go home to the families. It's also really important to have training, um, getting your nutrition staff, health service staff, other health-related staff together to you know, experience the, the curriculum, 
even you can even invite community partners and others who have resources that they can share and collaborate with the teachers. And then after the training, whoops, I guess I'm not quite there. Uh, after the training, check back in with your teachers to see if they need technical assistance or support. Sometimes teachers prefer one-on-one -on -one help and others may want an email. Um, say it, some may welcome resources both ways. So let's talk a little bit about how to carry lessons home and continue uh, the learning. If your nutrition curriculum includes at home components, then that's great, or you can create your own. And we have several, we have an activity library, which has various at home activities and ideas. And I can put that in the chat and we can also email it out to you. Let's see if I can, there it is. This is a great resource for finding things to send home to families. You can take your uh, programming a step further by engaging students and families to build stronger partnerships, like we talked about having them involved in school gardens or planning a fun interactive family event um, that they can do scavenger hunts or uh, just different. Of course, again, it's really challenging if you can't have parents on campus um, trying to find ways that you can still do it. But leveraging in-person and virtual opportunities, um, having a health fair, I'm hosting the after-school gardening event. I got ahead of myself this time, I guess. I shared my, my thoughts before I shared, <laughs> before we got to the part where I was supposed to intentionally share them. Um, but teaching families how to grow simple fruits and vegetables at home, setting up food science experiments for students and families to test out, and inviting parents and caregivers to participate in planning um, by asking about their interests and providing opportunities for them to take a leadership role, like organizing a garden event or recruiting other families to attend. And if y'all have anything that, that you uh, have experienced that you can relate back to, feel free to interrupt me or, or drop into chat. Let's talk a little bit about student engagement and making sure your lessons are connecting. Student feedback loops is a process of making sure the students are understanding the nutrition lessons that is specific, non-evaluative, so you're not um, grading them on it, manageable and focused. Nutrition education is well instructed when the feedback loops are used. So listening to these loops can tell a teacher if they need to revisit a certain topic or set a higher expectation. And these links um, are part of the PowerPoint, so you will be able to, to learn more about feedback loops and um, review that information on your own. You may want to know what this looks like or how you do this. You have to start small while reflecting and thinking aloud while you model. So ask students for feedback as a group and then individually and then point out effective attributes and revise. So um, I have several links that we'll share with you on feedback loops that you can learn more about. As we wrap up for the day, I just want to highlight a few of our other resources that support best practices that we talked about in, in our training today. Our website has two key resources, our resource library, which has a, a vast majority of our content lives there and includes all of our nutrition and healthy eating resources. There are ideas for taste tests, school gardens, nutrition education, best practices, how to read a nutrition fact label, which is something that is really helpful and, and kids love um, learning about the labels. We'll share these links. Um, we also have a healthy eating toolkit that we created last year that has great resources for, for parents and families, and it's in English and Spanish. And then there's tons of other free nutrition education resources out there from My Play, um, from Kids Health. And I have worked really closely in Texas with uh, our extension agents, AgriLife extension agents, um, or your county extension agents. They can provide resources for handouts. They can um, do cooking lessons. They do them free for uh, low-income schools. Um, so there's a lot of things they can do to help you as well. So those are all um, different things that you can um, access for your nutrition lessons. Then we also are providing you with some uh, resources around school gardens and farm to school, and then some um, 
web, websites for hunger awareness and resources. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. These are some additional ways to stay connected with Action for Healthy Kids. Um, we're kind of your one-stop shop for uh, staying healthy in body and mind. And in addition to the resources we shared today, you can find even more if you visit our website. Um, has additional blogs and uh, different resources and articles around child health and best practices. So we are here to support you. And if you have any questions, we would love to uh, answer them. And then this is something else we'd love you to put in the chat. The, if there's one key takeaway that you feel you gained from this learning session today, we would love for you to share that in the chat. And then we have an evaluation and your name will be entered for a chance to win a $100 Visa gift card if you complete the survey. You can either um, take a picture of the QR code there on the screen or, um, whoops, I keep thinking I can take that off of there, but I can't. <laughs> I, always, I always try to take my links off of there. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put the survey link into the chat. So you can either use the survey link to SurveyMonkey or you can use that QR code and just do a quick evaluation. I think it's like four questions and be entered for a chance to win a Visa gift card, which could come in handy during holidays. And then we will have our contact information. I think all of you pretty well know how to reach us. Um, so that's, but we'll definitely include that if you have any questions. Does anybody have anything that they want us to share more information on or any questions about the grant? Um, I'll also mention, um, because I've, I've found that those that use our resource library um, have found it pretty beneficial. One of the things I think that makes it is, of course, the resources, but you can also filter it by grade, by like subject matter. So if you're looking for nutrition education or physical activity. And so I think a lot have found those to be pretty um, useful um, just to kind of make a plug in there um for our resource library and it's, it is also up to date so when we went virtual um our team went you know really digging for and producing um resources that were you know that met the the need of of all of us at the time so it is it does stay up to date and it's always getting replenished with new and fresh ideas so it's always a, a good thing to check out if you're looking for any resources? Yes, we will. We can put the light. Do you want to? We can put the direct link to the library in, in our follow up email if you'd like. Yeah, you can do that for sure. Sure. So, Sandy likes the idea of the meal viewer. Thanks, Ida. Yeah, that was new for me as well. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you'd, be you'd be amazed how many kids um, I watch how it gets their attention. So, I try to put new things up even some of my staff would tell me I need to change sometimes but anyway it's just even though they can't hear because you know they keep them quiet the volume's not up but the attention the things that they really focus on when they're in there at lunch that helps calm them down some as well so you try to keep it uh interesting and all, while they're still learning at the same time and I also try to reinforce if the teachers have something they're doing in classroom if we can find things. I try to, I'm, I'm on YouTube a lot, just say that. I'm on YouTube and searching and just trying to keep it changing as much as possible. And now just giving more ideas of uh, how I could promote what we want to do with nutrition ed in the classroom, because I can reinforce it from the classroom to the cafeterias by using that. Awesome. Yeah. Anybody else have anything to share? If not, we'll give you twenty. We'll give you ten minutes back. <laughs> let you off a little early. I know you. It's getting late in Florida. <laughs> We're we good. We're all, we home. Morning. 
Yeah, we're fine. We both left office, so we'll be home when it's finished. So we're good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Planning ahead, you know? Yeah, really. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Well, I hope you all have wonderful holidays and everybody stays healthy and that things continue to improve where we can get our families back with yeah. our schools and, you know, and our kiddos. So. Mm -hmm. And thank you for joining us today and taking time out of your day to be with us. We really appreciate it. So 